democracy, even their power to think and act. Only occasional outbursts of rebellion or revolution can check the tendency of this government towards self-aggrandizement. However, the Sai rebellion put paid to this belief of Jefferson. He then proposed the idea of founding a new and building up of the Constitution by each succeeding generation. This would Jefferson thought safeguard the liberty of the future generations to choose the Constitution they would like to live under. This, in effect, amounted to a recurring revolution, but without violence. However, it would have thrown the whole body politic out of gear periodically, or more likely, have debased the act of foundation to a mere routine performance, in which case, even the memory of what he most ardently wished to save, that is, to the end of time, if anything human can so long endure, would have been lost. When this realization dawned upon him, he proposed decentralization of the political order. In proposing this, the person was concerned mainly with the protection of individual rights against encroachment either by the government or some section of the society. He was convinced that there was in every government on earth some trace of human weakness, some germ of corruption and degeneracy, which cunning will discover and wickedness insensibly open, cultivate and improve. He also believed that the rulers tend to turn into wolves and destroy the herd of the sheep, the guard, and the people shorn of their freedom are pushed to lethargy, the forerunner of the death of the public liberty or the preservation of the spirit of resistance to whatever government they have created, erected. Since the only power they retain is the residual power of revolution, <coughs> and if once the people become inattent inattentive to public affairs, you and I, Congress and Assembly, judges and governors, shall all become wolves. In effect, then, what the Democratic Republic did was to resurrect the age-old distinction between the ruler and the ruled that the revolution had set forth to abolish. As a result, the people were denied admission to the public realm where collective choices are made. Once more, the business of government became the privilege of a few. With the resurrection of the distinction between the ruler and the ruled, the well-being of the people came to depend on those who alone may exercise their virtuous, perhaps, disposition. And if they failed or proved unable to do so, the way was then paved for elective despotism, as Alexis Stockville was to find in the case of the United States of America. The only way out of this predicament was the establishment of what Jefferson called elementary republics that traditionally existed in townships and town councils. Emerson called them schools of the, schools of the people, which provided the citizens the space where they could assemble, discuss, and decide matters of common interest fully and freely. These schools taught the people the art of ruling and to be ruled in turn. These townships and town councils represented the organization of the people as it arises out of acting and speaking together and its true space 
lies between people living together no matter where they happen to be. The possibility of enlightened opinion becomes real when men communicate freely with one another and have the right to make their views public. And it is the confrontation between opposing viewpoints that conduces the people to exercise their region coolly and freely. In short, while the American Revolution won freedom for the people, it failed to create the space where freedom could have made its appearance. Will the people's representatives, not the people themselves, enjoy the fruits of freedom and could engage into activities of expressing, discussing, and deciding, which are, in a positive sense, the activities of freedom? Jefferson therefore called for providing the organs of true democracy. His proposal was to divide counties into wards to establish elementary republics. Only this, he believed, would secure to the people the right to exercise freedom, which was their inalienable birthright. Jefferson was convinced that if the plan of elementary republic were adopted, it would deliver representative democracy of its shortcomings and remove most of its blemishes. Could I once see that, Jefferson wrote to Cartwright on 5 June 1824, I consider it as the dawn of salvation of the republic. But here, could Jefferson's hope of seeing a new dawn of the salvation of the Republic be realized? It is true that the scheme of elementary Republic does provide for its members the scope for exercising their freedom in managing local affairs. But would elementary Republics be powerful enough to successfully contract the centralizing tendency that grows stronger, the growing complexity of economic life and relations. Even more important in this connection is the question whether the modern conditions of living would allow the individual to cultivate self-responsibility that self-rule demands. It is not necessary to point out that the success of democracy depends on the degree to which the people who participate in the management of public affairs are capable of self-transcendence as a necessary condition of moral self-development. Globalization of economic life and relations has radically changed the conditions that bear upon the question of establishing elementary republics. This mater the material aspect of human existence has driven a spiritual orientation far out of human consciousness. Local communities have reached the state of maximum of solacism. The rise of subjectivity has made disengaged instrumental mode of existence the reigning pattern today. The vision of the good has been eclipsed by the consideration of what is good to me and good for me. Consequently, there has occurred a loss of auto-control. This drives men to think and act in terms of what benefits them. It must be emphasized that the establishment of elementary republics is inexorably linked with the life conditions prevailing today. Also, this question cannot at all be delinked with the idea of who man is. The idea of who man is is currently understood in terms simply of a body-mind complex with the spiritual aspect effectively drained out. As a result, man emerges as a broken totality. He is at odds with his inner reality and alienated from both society and nature. Alienation creates inner vacuum, which is sought to be filled 
by the acquisition of more and more wealth and position. This means that the more the environment of human being is judged in terms of congruence with or subservience to self needs, the less fulfilling it becomes. For the very reason that expectations of fulfillment become at once so vast and amorphous, the possibilities of fulfillment are diminished as self needs become irresistible, social relations assume instrumental character. This destroys what Plato calls filia politicae, that is friendship among the members of a political community. When shareable commonality loses its salience, there is less of a reason to serve the common good. All these taken together have conspired to empty life of meaning and threaten public freedom, that is, the institutions and practices of self-government in both spiritual and political sense. What is all the more disturbing is the ascendance of the will, the wayward will that is supposed in modern times to be the bastion of freedom. For the wayward will, reason and rule, represent a sort of impersonal tyranny in relation to which, however, the will represents perfect freedom. Wrapped in subjectivity, the individual finds himself alone and separated from his fellow men. It is not surprising then that the individual personality dwindles to pure egoism, eroding the basis of morality. To repeat, the question of installing local democracy is inexorably linked with the conditions that now prevail. And the prevailing conditions do not augur well for the smooth functioning of the decentralized political order. As long as man remains separated from indwelling divine entity, his status as a broken totality will continue to bedevil his attempt to self-transcendence. Looked at from this perspective, Jefferson's scheme of elementary republics has no fair chance of success. This is so because it stops short of total renovation of the idea of who man is. Jefferson takes man as he is. Man who seeks his earthly salvation through what Mahatma Gandhi calls body worship. This means a greater reliance on technologically induced economic growth to supply goods and services to make man happy. But the effect of body worship is the proliferation of needs. As a consequence, demand of goods and services go on escalating as the standard of living swings upward. This will nourish the culture of what Chandogya Upanishad calls kamachar, behavior, human behavior driven by passions. This drowns the love of God in the sea of self-indulgence. This in turn promotes self-interest at the cost of shared ethical commitments to the public good. Given the primacy of material well-being, and the globalization of economic life and relations. Local communities have lost economic autonomy and important dimensions of human existence that constitutes the core of activity at the local level. As a result, local communities have become highly dependent on the world beyond themselves for meeting their ordinary life needs. They have become highly vulnerable to influences that emanate in their external environment. Economic interrelatedness demolishes barriers between different economies, breaks their self-sufficiency, disturbs their internal coherence, and sets in motion a process of homogenization by linking them with national, even international economy. 
This linkage tolerates no deviance and suffers no autonomy. Would elementary republics have enough inner resources to cope with the forces of change is a question that cries for answer. The question is important in as much as economic factors constitute today the prime mover of thoughtways and workways. However, they would be beyond the jurisdiction of local communities. The local communities would not be able to control and manage them. Add to it also the political factor. Politically, too, they would have little influence over legislative decisions affecting economic life and relations at the local level. But taken at higher echelons of the policy-making system. Wars would certainly enjoy self-rule, and citizens would personally participate in local decision-making. However, at higher echelons, it would be their representatives who will take part in the decision-making process. Thus, wars would have their presence, not directly, but only indirectly, through their representatives at the higher echelons of collective decision making. Given the present apex dominated system of government, the representatives of the wars would exercise little influence on the process of decision making that has a direct or indirect bearing on their own affairs. To make a success of the scheme of elementary republics then, in conditions that prevail now, two conditions have to be met. The first condition refers to the need of self-transcendence as a necessary condition of rising above self-interest and self-regarding action for overcoming disengaged instrumentality. The second condition concerns the need to reverse the pattern of lo locating authority and power at the apex of the system and rejoining freedom and power at the local level. This means reversing the pyramid of authority and power in a way that permits the base of the political order to have the primary authority and the power to manage their affairs themselves. This will allow them to play a more significant role in the management of public affairs than they currently do. In the self-rule must have a fully developed sense of self-responsibility. They must be ever conscious of reconciling the good of in one individual with the good of all individuals. This is consequent upon the reigning in of unruly passions that have been given a free hand in modern times. This has created a situation in which the faith in the divine has been lost, and there is no other means than the brittle barrier of laws to control them. It is this situation that prompted Montesquieu to ask, punishment will cast out of society a citizen who, having lost his morage, violates the law. But if everyone loses his morage, will punishment reestablish them? This brings us to contemplate the problem of moral crisis that cannot be surmounted by ejecting everyone from the society. This should make us aware of the fact, as it did Rousseau, that private interest, which in the case of conflict necessarily prevails over everything, teaches everyone to adorn vice with the mask of virtue. The vice of cupidity mas masquerading as virtue cannot be mitigated by the simple-minded changes in the institutional structure of society or by recourse to political reforms. No will, nor will the freedom reform of laws and institutions lead willy-nilly to political improvement unless they are accompanied by an underlying improvement, improvement of the spirit of those who operate them. What this means is that the 
neglect of the spiritual and moral dimension is the source of the civilizational crisis that we face today. Moral regeneration is the only way out of it, obviously. Changes in the exterior of man are of no help in this. What is required is internal change, signifying self-transformation. Once internal change occurs, outward forms would take care of itself. What everybody should, Mahatma Gandhi insists, be concerned with is a radical change more in inward spirit than in the outward form. If the first remains unchanged, the second, no matter how radically changed, will be like a whited sepulcher. The process of inward change is the process of self-transformation. It implies the taming of the beast in man. It is accomplished when man recognizes his true nature. When man succeeds in developing his real nature to the fullest, he attains the status of Dvija. This allows him to recognize that he is a special creation of God, precisely to the extent that he is distinct from the rest of the creation. The realization comes to him that he cannot rely on external freedom to protect internal freedom, because relying on it, we often find that the laws made to freedom, made to secure freedom turn out to be shackles binding us. For Mahatma Gandhi then, Swaraj, that is freedom, is primarily the rule over oneself. It cannot come from any external circumstances.